you very much. I want to suggest that maybe we should start looking at the opportunities for prevention. Yes. Because what we all want to do is reduce the burden of disease. And if we don't think about the prevention side of that, we only think about the care side of that, I think we're missing most of our opportunities because our opportunities at the, at the burden side when somebody has advanced disease, unfortunately, are limited uh, despite important innovation. So um, our mission in public health is healthy people in healthy communities. Our mission, we do three things. protect health, we prevent disease, and we promote health and well-being. And we're a pretty large department, but small compared to the medical care system. And one of the first things I asked was, how many people in L.A. County currently are living with COPD? And depending on what you look at, you get very different numbers. So it's somewhere between uh, maybe 105, 110,000 on one hand and maybe 300,000 on another. Um, so part of this highlights the issue of trying to really get an accurate count. And even though we have very good um, survey instruments, um, they are uh, still imperfect and we have more to do on that. But we have some good news and that is if you just look at adjusted uh, mortality rates, we've come down from over a period of a decade by 17% for COPD. Now that is good news, but it also pales compared to how we're doing with coronary heart disease and stroke, for example, um, or even uh, pneumonia and influenza. Um, area obviously that's going to compound everything is the growth of the older population. Uh, so even though the rates may not change, the numbers are going to go up very substantially. Um, and I think this is a problem we all face, that as you get older, your chance of having chronic disease goes up logarithmically. Now, uh, there are big differences in COPD mortality by gender and race. Um, you can see that there's a particular uh, variation in, in gender in the African-American population and the Asian Pacific Islander population, but notice also that the base rates are very different, with the lowest being Latino and Asian Pacific Islander and higher being non-Hispanic, white, and African-American. And if you look at service planning, these are spas. Now, not the spas you want to luxuriate in. <laughs> this is LA divided into eight different geographic areas, and the Antelope Valley um, takes the number one prize in terms of mortality rate by a long shot, by double over any place else. And you can see there still are wide variations among the other service planning areas. Um, risk factors you could write the book on, but let me, as preface to this, say that most of the improvements we've had in health in this country and worldwide come from changes in policy. And we have to think of that in public health and population health if we want to make the kinds of progress that we all, I think, do. So smoking and secondhand smoke exposure, of course, is the major preventable cause, but exposure and air pollutants in Los Angeles County is very important, and oftentimes, I mean, you don't, you're not going to see air pollution as a cause of death on a death certificate, but when you look epidemiologically, you see the importance of that factor. Genetic factors, of course, respiratory infections, one of the ones that I've yeah, most recently, coccidiomycosis, valley fever, underappreciated, uh, but in the, in the uh, semi-arid soils and uh, uh, when you have a lot of wind or when you have construction, particularly in, in the valleys, um, you have significant problems with, with this. Um, now, we have been and were a leader in tobacco control uh, because we passed the first tobacco tax but we've fallen behind. Look at our rate. Our rate is 87 cents per pack. That's hardly a leadership role. And when you look at New York, you look at New York, and you see that it's basically five times, 500% what California is. You can see that the tobacco lobby has been very active, and that efforts to try and raise that have not been successful. And you saw how many tens of millions of dollars the industry has put into trying to defeat initiatives to increase tax, despite the fact we know one of the most effective ways to reduce both initiation and use over time. We were the first, uh, one of the first to have a work, uh, workplace law, smoke-free workplace, smoke-free restaurants, smoke-free bars, which was part of the same restaurant law, and we've had hard-hitting counter-advertising campaigns. California has been a leader in all of these areas. Um, 
And over the last 10 years, we've worked with the 85 cities that we're responsible for and the other three that have their own public health departments uh, to improve uh, the number of policies. And so these break down the policies, as you can see. By the way, LA County supervisors are, are responsible for over 1 million people in the unincorporated areas, and they have also been in a leadership capacity with respect to these, uh, to these ordinances and regulations, which have made a big difference. So here's the prevalence of smoking among adults, and you can see that starting about the year 2000, we've made precious little progress, despite all the good work that you and many other groups have done, and we certainly have been focused very much on this. Um, and uh, we're still not um, at the areas we want to be in terms of the level. We're at um, roughly a million smokers still in L.A. County. I'm sure not in this room, but uh, there's a lot of other people. Actually, the highest rates of uh, tobacco use in L.A., who, who do you think has the highest rates? Sorry? Sorry? Teenagers? No. Sorry? College students? No. Sorry? Women. How many do you think women? No. Okay, the highest rates of use are among the LGBT community, um, those that have other substance abuse problems, and those with mental health problems. Those are the three groups with the highest use rates. Uh, but if you look at the adult smokers by gender and race, in LA County, you can see we have huge differences by gender um, with basically men smoking 60% greater rate in terms of number of smokers than, than women, the rate of smoking. Um, and you see that among all groups, but you see really big differences, particularly in Latinos. You see huge differences in Asian Pacific Islanders, um, and you see differences all around. The highest rate of smoking, however, are in African Americans, no surprise, given the excess mortality of many issues smoking related. There's a lot of smoking cessation work, there's 1-800-NO-BUTS, there's ask advice and refer. Um, there are guidelines and U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has recommendations with respect to human advice on smoking cessation to patients. Um, there's a lot of different language service-based services. Um, we have a website, laquits.com, provides information, provides tips. Um, many places are giving out free uh, nicotine um, patches. Um, there's a lot of efforts, and you saw the very large effort that the CDC just recently put out with very graphic images. The FDA is now considering what it's going to do. It's going to have hundreds of millions of dollars to, to spend on anti-tobacco advertising. So you're going to see more nationally, and I hope we're going to be able to do more locally as well. We're focusing on the populations with the highest grade, and in fact, tomorrow there will be a press conference about the LGBT community and efforts to a new campaign to try and reduce the rates in that group, which is basically twice the rate of the general population. Now, you can see this is good news or bad news. Um, this is the age-adjusted rates, and you can see, first of all, that the U.S. rate continues to go up a little bit in California. We have seen a decline in Los Angeles. We've even seen a greater decline. But it's not a huge decline in that. We are separating out the different lines here, but we have a lot of progress to make. And given the lead time from exposure to chronic lung disease, it's going to continue to take some time if we want to get it down to the levels uh, where, um, you know, where it should be, which is close to zero. The trends in lung cancer mortality, again, we're a leader because we've been very active in smoking cessation and in policies. Um, California also is doing well. The U.S. behind us. Uh, but with the rates of tobacco taxes in other places, we would expect that that difference may narrow. So here's the health impacts of air pollution in Southern California. This is South Coast Air Quality Management District. This is data from 2010. And, you know, th this is an attributable risk. We don't know the exact number, but this is the best estimate we have. But think about that, 6,200 premature deaths. This is annual rates. And hospitalizations, yes, there's a lot of issues about rehospitalization, trying to prevent hospitalization, but there's 2,400 hospitalizations a year 
and there's 140,000 asthma and lower respiratory symptoms, and almost a million lost workdays. So why should employers be involved and interested and concerned about wellness programs? Well, this gives you an easy answer. But once again, you can see the disproportionate influence of air pollution. Now, on the other hand, there is good information that things are getting better in air pollution. You can see that uh, if you look at ozone trends there, the number of days exceeding the, uh, the standards in California, which is the red line, and the national standard, which is the blue line, they're both going down in lockstep, and that's good news, except you have to wonder what happened in about 1998. Um, but look at look at this, look at P2.5, which we know goes down as deep into the lungs into the alveoli. And this is really where we've made the greatest progress in terms of days exceeding the national standard. Having said that, we know that we still have very high rates compared to many parts of the country. And another approach is to look at sensitive land uses within 500 feet of a freeway, especially now that uh, diesel, uh, the products of diesel combustion have been and have been called out to be a known carcinogen uh, by the international community. And that uh, that was chaired, that group, by Jonathan Samet, who's head of preventive medicine here. Um, but sensitive land uses include residences, schools, child care centers, playgrounds, and medical facilities, because we know that proximity to highly trafficked freeways is, in fact, a risk factor. But on the other hand, you have to balance that. Where can you find land for schools? Where can you find land for some of these other purposes um, that you need for large public activity? Not so easy. Um, here's some of the things that we need. We need stronger mandates for the use of zero emission vehicles and low emission vehicles. California has been the leader, but we have not done quite as well with respect to trucks. And we look at what's going on with the Port of LA and the Port of, uh, of uh, Long Beach together have 40% of all the goods that come into this country. So unless we can do something there and from the, and the transit that goes from there um, through, through parts of Los Angeles, uh, we're not going to make the kind of progress we need to make. We need also better mass transit. How many of you took mass transit coming here today? Thank you. <laughs> if there was a problem, you would get it. So that suggests uh, that we have some opportunities. Um, and we need to reduce the auto dependence. We absolutely must if we're going to reduce air pollution. And remember that we're increasing the population, not as fast as some projections had thought 10 or 15 years ago, but the LA Basin is increasing its population. And if we still are so dependent on auto travel, not only are we going to take three or four hours to get four blocks, but we're going to wind up with more and more pollution. So here are some opportunities in the era of health reform, and you've really talked about uh, these uh, most of the morning. But I think important opportunities with access to coverage, with no cost preventive services, with primary care medical homes, and with increased, increased accountability for outcomes. And if we look at that, it becomes extremely important. We have a dearth of primary care physicians. We certainly have a dearth of geriatricians. Um, and yet we're going to increase the number of those age 65 and older doubled from over a 20 year period we expect from 2010 to 2030. How are we going to accommodate that large group with a logarithmic increase in burden and chronic disease? But we also have this persistence of health inequities. Um, and that is true in, in COPD as other chronic conditions with huge differences. You know, um, Bob Ross from the California Endowment is, uh, they had a campaign at the American Public Health Association last year that said, your zip code, your health may be more determined by your zip code, mm. right, than your genetic code. Mm. And that is certainly true. And we cannot solve the disparity simply through better treatment. That will not do it. We have to look at prevention, and we look at prevention, we have to think of the social conditions, the physical conditions, and the economic conditions. Poverty is a poison, and it poisons people in many different ways. But you see huge differences, whether it's looking at obesity rates, chronic disease rates, no matter what, we see these disparities. And we have, if we want to really make a difference in COPD with respect to these disparities, we have to look at social justice issues, we have to look at siting issues, we have to look at uh, our tax system. All those are important.
board. So we have a community transformation grants. That's good money from the Prevention of Public Health Fund. We've been focusing on tobacco-free living, um, on active living and healthy eating, active transportation, school meals. We've done a lot on sugar-sweetened beverages. We have a program with restaurants to offer smaller portions to Choose Health LA restaurants. Um, we do think that, of course, clinical and other preventive services are important, but we have to also think that there are a lot of commercial interests that are not necessarily have health as their prime concern. So you've been over these provisions. I don't really need to, to go to, through these because you've talked about them, but certainly all these will help as well as the research that's going to go on and uh, the PCORI will help identify clinically effective treatments and diagnostic tests. So, um, it's, of course, it goes without saying that it's very important that insurance companies' health plans not be able to drop somebody because they have COPD. There's more support for preventive services and the increased coordination that we expect and are trying to achieve between care providers and electronic medical records can be very helpful, but we're a long way from having that uniformly. And unfortunately, there still are differences between what look, we look at in clinical medicine, where one is looking at the population as the population of a health plan or of a medical group, and the overall population geopolitically defined. They are not the same. And we have to figure out how to bring those concerns together, because we can't get there to improve the health of everybody if we only look at patient-based as the way of thinking of population. So here's what we need. We need surveillance for, to better characterize the total CDPD. Good to have a number that we could rely on um, to assess the effectiveness of both treatment and prevention. We need early detection and linkage to high quality services. Um, we need the wraparound services, but we also have to focus on community-based prevention. Tobacco control and air pollution um, transit-oriented development is really important, active living, and of course, as always, you always say that you need more research, but we need very targeted research. Some of the research that's being done is really not necessarily the research that's going to make the difference, and we need more implementation research. How do we take policies, how do we get policies enacted, how do we put things into practice? And with that, I will get you to lunch.